Does he make shoulder? and sell his own snake oil per <laughs> chance, Chad? <laughs> Maybe. Oh, mom bought, bought plenty of that. Welcome to Holy Ghosting, a podcast about deconstruction from your middle-aged mom friends. I'm Lindsay, and I will never march in the infantry. And I'm Meg, and I will never ride in the cavalry. And I'm Sarai, and I may and will not ever fly or the enemy. <laughs> I can't do the sound. I can't do it. It's it's machine guns from kids. Because we're not in, in the, the Lord's, Lord's army. army. No, sir. Hello, everybody. We are so excited to have Chad Harris on the pod today. He was featured in the Shiny Happy People docuseries on the Duggars and IDLP and reached out to me on Instagram a while ago after listening to some of our uh, Too Many Colts mini series. And I really loved everything he had to say and his like personality and wit and was like, will you come on Holy Ghosting? And he said yes. So Chad Harris, welcome to Holy Ghosting. Thank you so much for having me. I am excited to be here. Love talking about uh, cults, my experience in them, and how we can take them down. Heck. Yes. Amen. We received that word. Let's bring all these cults <laughs> down. I, I feel yeah. testimony in my spirit today. So. <laughs> <laughs> um. So we want to get into a little bit of everything with you today, Chad. And if you guys don't already, he follow him on the interwebs. I'm going to start with this. You are Arch Radish That's on correct. the internet, That's Chad right? Harris mixed up, yes. <gasps> That's what it is. In my head, I envision as I see like little radishes fighting each other. They're like arch nemeses of each other. That's how I envision it. So um, I do but- too now. <laughs> Maybe that needs to be your new logo. Uh, You are a character on TikTok and on Instagram and the interwebs, and you're really honest and open about your experiences in getting out of a conservative fundamentalist cult. And so we want to get into maybe a little bit more of your personal experiences today that like you weren't able to get into, into the documentary. And sort of, I'm very curious about sort of how you got into it and then how you got out of it. So maybe let's go to the beginning and I'd love to know, like, were you were you born into this? Like, how did this happen? Did your when did your parents get into this kind of theology? And is it kind of like all you knew as a kid? Well, certainly, yes. My dad actually uh, got into fundamentalism in general uh, when he was working at a cast iron pipe shop in Birmingham, Alabama. He um, he had rededicated his life to God through a coworker and decided to become a preacher. He went to a Southern Baptist seminary where he led a student uh, protest when he believed that the faculty were holding seances. Now, to this day, I don't know if they really were or not, or if that was like a proto-satanic panic thing, but uh, he led a protest and he got kicked off campus. Oh my God, I just want to say it. Yeah. Can we talk to your dad about that? Yeah. Yeah. (laughs) Like, I wish I'm... you could, but he's kind of tied up. He's six feet under, so there's that. Well, <laughs> uh, when we get to heaven. I'll do a seance. I'll do a seance. I took a meeting. Oh, no, that might work. Perfect. Yes. Yeah, yeah. Yes. I think it's the perfect thing. I love do a seance He'll just show after. up and protest. Yeah. <laughs> He'll protest his own seance. That's right. Yeah, yeah. he will. Yeah. I love it. Especially He'll if I'm up. there. But, um... <laughs> But yeah, so he uh, so he led a student protest and he got kicked off campus, but then he was courted by a man named Jack Hiles, who was the uh, pastor of a church, uh, First Baptist Church of Hammond, Indiana. And Jack Hiles was a noted independent fundamental Baptist who was trying to start a college that we now know today as Hiles Anderson College up in the same area. Uh, he actually recruited dad and a few other uh, folks who were involved in that to uh, be at, at the very first class for this college. Like he, they were basically the first students. But my dad didn't get along with Jack Hiles either. Uh, he was too fundamentalist for Jack Hiles. He was so convinced that Jesus was going to return any day now that he wanted to start preaching while he was in school. Jack Hiles said, well, you're not ready yet. And dad said, well, what if the Holy Spirit tells me that I'm ready? And Jack Hiles said, well, while you're here, I'm the Holy Spirit. And (gasps) offense to that. (laughs) That's an amazing thing to say. That's amazing. So I didn't know you could do that. I thought that was blaspheming of the Holy Spirit or something. Well, can we do that? 
Yeah, I mean, it doesn't matter if you're if you're a preacher, you see, you know, you get right. a pass on those things. Oh, yeah, yeah you get oh, that yeah. free pass. Oh, absolutely. Yeah. yeah. You get a free 100%. pass on everything. 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 Yeah. everything it, yeah. yeah. Because Ask it, Bill it Gothard is... spoilers. Uh, <laughs> yeah, right? Jeez. Yeah. Yep. Okay. Oh, oh, my God. Yeah, so your dad one, heard from the Holy Spirit. But uh, what's his name was like, no, I'm the Holy Spirit as far as you're concerned. And I'm guessing that did not so well with your father. Not at all. So he started pastoring smaller churches, primarily in Alabama, and eventually uh, felt the need to go to the mission field uh, where he uh, was a missionary to the dark, non-Christian, apparently, countries of the Netherlands and Belgium. Uh, <laughs> Yeah, like two wrong of the kind most of Christian Christians? countries of the world. Yeah, the wrong yeah, kind of Christian. Yeah. They weren't yeah. fundamentalist, you see. Exactly. And yeah. uh, and because he was so scared of the secular influence that uh, the schools had on the kids, that's when he started homeschooling. So Ooh, at that classic. time, he had three children, my three older siblings, and he started homeschooling them rather than let them to go to the Dutch school system. Uh, the Dutch had an issue with that, so he moved across the border to Belgium where that was permitted. What? Yeah. Okay. So, sorry. I'm really excited. I like this story. So, much. <laughs> yeah. so eventually, his hearing started going. Uh, hereditary and also working in a cast iron pipe shop will do that to you. So he decided to stop trying to learn a foreign language and go to England and work in a military work, where he pastored for a while, and that's where I was born. But when I was ten months old, we moved back to Alabama uh, for good, and that's where I lost my British accent at age 10 months um Bomber. i bet you had a really cute baby british accent though you know Very much so. you cried you cried with an accent i'm sure yeah. like why uh, but I, I don't know there's, yeah. there's like a liver liver Pudlian thing going on i think i don't know <laughs> but um so we moved back to walker county alabama where my folks are from and about this time you see i was born 10 years after my older brother who was the next step for me so I was very clearly not exactly planned, and my parents took every opportunity to remind me of that. So what? That's sweet. No, oh, yeah. like I you're was... our little miracle baby. We love you so much, extra above and beyond your siblings because of that. Is that what they were doing? Whatever the opposite of that is. <laughs> uh... <laughs> okay, bummer. Yeah, yeah too bad. Sorry, yeah. I'm okay. Way too much of an optimist. Yeah. yeah. Mm. No, you haven't met my mom. But um, <laughs> so my mother was getting, you know, um, getting into her late 30s, early 40s, wasn't really relishing the thought of having any more children. So she wanted to talk to her OBGYN about, you know, the upcoming menopause and also how to effectively family plan without taking any drastic measures like surgery or anything. And her OBGYN was also a fundamentalist Christian because mm. they specifically tried to find people who were of that nature. Oh, and this particular Keep OBGYN, it in the cold. Hmm. exactly. Well, this particular OBGYN uh, asked my mom, uh, even though he was a uh, um, he he was Presbyterian, he was very conservative Presbyterian. He asked mom, uh, "Well, have you decided to maybe just turn that over to God? How many children do you have?" Oh. And she said, "Well, what do you mean?" And he gave her a book entitled "A Full Quiver." No. Oh. Mm -hmm. Which was my parents' first foray into the quiverful world, right? God damn right. it. All right. from an OBGYN? Ugh. From a licensed I... OBGYN. As a person who has pushed a baby outside of my body, I really hate this for your mom. I hate that this is like what oh yeah. Me got too. her in. Yeah. That was in my early 30s. And I'm like, I if I were having babies still right now, I just I cannot imagine being alive. Like Wow. Okay. That's some radical faith right there. Well, my mom was all about it and she had two more children after me. Uh, so seven years after I was born came my younger brother and then my youngest sibling um, a little bit later when she was well into her forties at that point. Dang, yeah. But um, also at the same time, um, there were seminars being held in the Birmingham area. At this point, I was about seven years old and her and this OBGYN uh, were like, Oh, let's check this out, actually, uh, because, you know, they were interested in homeschooling me completely, you know, because my older siblings had all had some various form of Christian or public school at some point in their lives. Uh, she was like, well, I want to homeschool him completely. And she was going to pull my older brother who had 
come back to a Christian school here in the States to acclimate. She was like, I want to homeschool him as well. So we need a curriculum that works for both of us. So they went to a Bill Gothard seminar and they were talked into joining the Advanced Training Institute, mm -hmm. uh, the homeschool branch of IBLP. Mm -hmm. So we joined when I was about seven years old and I studied it until I graduated at age 17. So. What? Wow. Okay. So I have it was the, the homeschool is what hooked you. Mm -hmm. That's like yeah. what got y'all in. Interesting. Okay. So it right, was gradual. Right. We we started with cult leaders, then we went to Quiverful, mm -hmm. then we went to mm -hmm. ATI. Yeah. Okay. I this is gonna be a strangely arcane question, slash I don't know if you knew this at your early childhood slash kindergarten education time. I'm Every time I saw an episode of Shiny Happy People, I was transfixed by the concept of how this business worked. Like, was it an MLM? Like, was it people signed on and there was like a monthly payment? Like, I come from a family that was, you know, my mom especially was very, very rigorously conservative. I listened to Rush Limbaugh every day as like a major part of my education and childhood experience for nine years. You know, that's that's the kind of world I was in. But we only bought homeschool curriculum like one or two times because it was too expensive. I think it was, you know, my dad worked in a mill and things like that. So I didn't know if this was more like targeted at middle-class folks or like upper middle-class, or if there was some way that people with fewer resources could get in to that. Well, I'm, I'm the first to tell you, we were poor as hell. Uh, cause yeah, dad, right. dad at that point, he was a bivocational pastor. He mm -hmm. pastored a small church in, you know, the backwoods of Walker County, and mm -hmm. he also was a maintenance man at a retirement home in Birmingham mm -hmm. at the same time. So he's, wow. you know, all of his time was spent basically on the road. Um, mm -hmm. Our church had about maybe 30 people on a good day, and a wow. lot of those are relatives. So, <laughs> yeah, we, we used to meet that's in why you had to have. Yeah. yeah, that's why you had to have more children is to fill the churches, right? Because they were empty. You had to, like, wrong. populate. Yeah. Yeah, oh, and currently yeah. still a strategy a fun fun fact <laughs> a matter of fact you know when when my folks went quiverful you know the whole church basically you know tried to go quiverful like dad really pushed it as this is how you should be living your life biblically from the pulpit so we had a lot of uh we had a lot of families uh kind of follow along with that my oldest sister uh who was already married by the time i was about one or two uh she ended up having nine children so what? Uh, yeah, it was, um, it, it was, it was really a whole, um, my dad tried to make it a movement, uh, mm -hmm. and, and, and propagate it. Now, most people who followed ATI in the Birmingham area were upper class. Um, mm -hmm. this doctor, uh, and his family, they ended up being our best friends in the cult. Uh, there mm -hmm. were other doctors, there were some, uh, politically tied families. Uh, there were a lot of people in this mega church, uh, the, uh, Presbyterian church where a lot of uh, ATI stuff was propagated from um, that there were a lot of people of the upper class that uh, really bought into it and that was very attractive for my folks because otherwise we would have never been able to hang in those circles mm -hmm. so my older brother and my parents you know spent a lot of time with you know people of that nature um, at, at like different meetups and what have you so yeah it was um, that was really who was targeted uh, like middle class and upper but i do know of like many other families like our own who didn't have a whole lot but somehow were able to scrape together i think at the time and this is 1990s money so it was like 600 bucks a year to uh do this curriculum and it was you know per, it was more than per we could kid, afford. do you think uh technically i think it was supposed to be per well i think it was per family so I mean, I, I don't have I don't have the exact right, numbers on that, right. but I do remember that there was a little box that says six hundred bucks on the uh, on the form. So there's that. I remember that I was homeschooled as well until ninth grade, and I'm a pastor's kid, and we never used ATI's curriculum. We used a Becca, and there was these life packs. I mean, all pretty damn similar like as far as you know only creation women are meant to have babies and dress a certain way you know that whole thing and I do know that because we were pretty poor too and so there's a lot of like steep discounts for like pastors and things like that's a, a lot of the ways we could afford some of the stuff is that like if you're a pastor or missionary what oh. have you that they'll get you into the fold but it's similar I feel like we grew up like the churches my dad would pastor out. A lot of our friends were much wealthier than we were or were doctors or would, you know, give my parents their beach house for the weekend so we could go on vacation or something, you know, like, cause we didn't have a fucking beach house. <laughs> well, 
like that was not a thing that we were doing. So yeah, that's, that's interesting. Cause I remember it. Cause then I went to Christian high school and you know, I was like, that shit was expensive, but same thing. I think they gave us like 50% off for being a pastor. Wow. I got 50% off to go to my, to go get indoctrinated again to, yeah, to get. No wonder but- I wanted to be a PK. Okay. <laughs> uh, yeah. So, you know, similar to uh, what you were describing there, uh, Lindsay, the, um, we, we started by like taking old Abeka books and what have you. We, we, we tried a few different curricula at first before we went into ATI. None of it really worked for both myself and my older brother at the same time because he was much older than me. So <laughs> IBLP promised that, you know, ATI's curriculum was supposed to uh, be for the entire family. The entire family could learn wow. together at the same time from the same wisdom booklets, no matter wow. how old or young you were, right? Oh, so that, that was, is cost effective. That is. Yeah. It's a really good idea. Yeah. yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, that, and, they, they and I the like this idea yeah. too that they started kind of with the pastors. Like in Lindsay, we were saying something similar yeah. with your family that I think, yeah, if you give the pastors a 50% off discount or whatever, they're going to preach about it from the pulpit. So you just yeah. have a like an MLM without them it's, earning money. It is that influencer piece that I think the docuseries actually addresses at the very end. Yep. The shift mm-hmm. from just this sort of celebrity style, like Bill Gothard, to also having those disciples. So yes, an MLM without any of the pastors receiving the financial benefits from it, as far as I know, but who knows? Well, and also, I, I'm i not sure if my family ever experienced any benefits from like any discounts right. or anything like that. So, you know, that's something yeah. I don't have the luxury of asking them at this point. But um, <laughs> what I can say is that, um, you know, for so I had a little taste of regular and i put this in the biggest quotes i can (laughs) christian homeschooling beforehand but when we moved to ati there was a marked change because i distinctly remember being able to watch more programs on pbs i was a huge fan of we're in the world's garments in diego square one yes 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 yeah, yes. and uh, so I love that, and all of a sudden that was off limits. Um, the Disney afternoon Whoa. definitely off limits. Oh, know. definitely. Yeah, yeah, oh, yeah. you yeah. try watching gummy bears after you're in. Uh, oh no, 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 no! We weren't allowed no. to watch gummy. Bears. I wasn't allowed gummy bears. Exactly, but my mom <laughs> always had a migraine, so she was like, mm-hmm. I didn't care after a certain point, and we'd just right. eat like little Debbie snacks, uh, the Nutter Butter, whatever that's called, the Nutty Buddies. Oh, yeah. Anyway. Disney afternoon, the whole way through, all the way up until like Jeopardy's on. We had a whole plan. <laughs> oh yeah, yeah, required watching. Yeah. So we, yeah, that got cut off pretty quickly because my dad at one point after going to the seminar thought that the TV had taken up too much of his own authority in the house, so the TV went off. We eventually brought it back by getting a VCR and we watched very heavily censored. Um, you know, TV shows and stuff, and Green oh Gables being probably the one thing that we watch more of than anything else because oh, wow. my mom and older brother just loved it. Um, You're throwing me for so many loops. Like, I feel like I've also had this same media diet. And <laughs> to this day, Anne of Green Gables is like the ultimate weirdly perverse comfort food that does feed my soul. Because I really identified for, with her. Uh, for some, I was like, I too am a redheaded orphan. Why is my hair so brown? Just kidding, it was blonde then. But now it's brown and I'm still like, kind of mad about it. <laughs> okay, sorry, go on, go on. Her, hey, her hair was green at some point in the series. So, yeah, you know, that's true. That's <laughs> true yeah. and I love yeah. that part. Yeah, she did it before it was cool. So we did that for, you know, like, I noticed, like, these changes, like, uh, toys I used to could play with I can no longer play with. Oh. I had a uh, Commodore 64 computer that I loved to tinker on. That was heavily oh. monitored uh, <laughs> from that point forward. So gradually I noticed, like, we could do less and less, and mm-hmm. we had to focus more and more on the spiritual aspects of mm. IBLP. We had to get up mm-hmm. at, like, 5 in the morning before Deb went an hour into work in the morning and, you know, read Psalms and Proverbs every morning as a family so things like that you know it was just like this ritualistic uh focus on all these high concepts that me as a seven-year-old had no clue what any of (laughs) this was like Mm -hmm. i'll give you an example like you know we we started with the wisdom booklets and bill gothard said anyone can understand the wisdom booklets or timeless truths and everything blah 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 uh there was an entire because the way they worked they took little passages from the Sermon on the Mount in order, and each booklet d- dived into th- what the uh, what the verse actually was saying, according to Bill Gothard. 
So for example, uh, the wisdom booklet on give us this day our daily bread. Uh, there was an entire like eight page section in the wisdom booklet about constipation and why whole wheat bread would relieve people of constipation, how white bread was inherently sinful for some reason. Wow. As a child, I don't care, <laughs> you know, like, <laughs> why am I learning this? This is, this has nothing to do with anything I can use in real life. But the minute you start questioning it, the minute you start getting what Michelle Duggar euphemistically calls encouragement. So there's that. Mm. What is me... encouragement? Like, what was that like for in your family or in your community? That's what's getting smacked. So, right? yeah. yeah. <laughs> So if you've seen episode two of Shiny Happy People and mm -hmm. you saw the little kid with the yellow shirt. Yes, I will never haven't. forget I'm this with scene. I, it comes into my dreams now and I'm like, what the fuck? It's really <laughs> seared into my mind like this. Really, yeah, it's wild. Yeah, I, I had that was the one scene where I had to I was watching it with my friend Heather Heath. Uh, the devil sticks girl from the uh, <laughs> from the documentary. Uh, we were watching it together, and that was the scene where I had to say, "We need to stop right now." Yeah, yeah. You know, I need yeah. I need to breathe. <laughs> like yes. that, yes. that threw me for a loop. That entire ritual was pretty much what I experienced from my Jeez. dad, yeah. um, and which my dad was like the main disciplinarian in the family. Uh, if we had anything that he had to tend to when he got home. Uh, it would be that entire routine, but strung out over what felt like an hour where he Ugh. basically, you know, like put you on the witness stand right there in front of the bed and like interrogate you about what you'd done and how it was <clears throat> sinful and all that sort of thing. And then the whole spanking ritual would start. With my mom, whenever she deigned to do it herself, it was just straight up madness, screaming, hitting, whatever. Mm -hmm. So... You know, if I had to have it done, I preferred to have it done by dad because at least it was quieter. Mom would just completely fly off the handle. I do believe that she, even to this day, has some unaddressed issues that should have been seen to by a professional. Mm -hmm. And I believe my dad thought so too because he told us that our main job was to keep her from, in his words, going crazy. Because Whoa. he believed she would go physically insane if we disobeyed. No pressure. So that pressure was put on you as a kid, as a little yes. kid and your younger siblings. Wow. Mm -hmm. Yeah. So that must have been a really it, tough yeah. environment to grow up in, Chad. I'm so sorry. It's like you've had years and years and years of therapy. I have. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. Uh, we, yeah, <laughs> that was one of the first things my therapist and I covered because my dad had the archaic idea that, you know, women could go insane if they were upset during their period. Wow. And, hysterical I, yeah. I told this to my therapist who was a woman and she literally like start it threw back her head and laughed at the top of her lungs she was like is your dad from the 1800s <laughs> she was like <laughs> seriously yeah, like of. this this is not even you know yeah like 20th century shit she said this is so old that it has been discredited so many times she said how dare he Does put he that on his make children? and sell his own snake oil per <laughs> chance <laughs> chad <laughs> Maybe. Oh, mom yeah. bought, bought plenty of that. That was another thing she was into. Uh, <laughs> at one point, we, we literally had a, I, I went to go visit her as an adult. And she had a bottle of snake venom extract, or so it was purported to be homeopathic snake uh, steak venom extract. Oh, of course. course. Great. And, yeah. and I, I told her, I was like, mom, this is literally snake oil. It is on the label. <laughs> like, it is, it's, it's fake, you know? Oh. She, yeah. I have some, a gem from another podcast and I just, you know, I'll shout out a little podcast I listened to too for about a decade. Stuff you should know. People might've heard of it, but I did learn in the snake oil episode that it actually did work for somehow. what? Oh no, no. I'm sorry. I'm shouting out the wrong fucking podcast. This is actually, you're wrong about, of oh, course yeah. it's you're wrong yeah. about, of course it's a Sarah Michael Marsh Hobbs joint. Yeah. Well, What's not anymore, yeah. but right. we it also was. love us. We love us some Sarah Marshall. Please yeah. come on our Please. podcast. We love all of everyone involved in that universe. Okay. So also it does really work. <laughs> For what? Uh it has like it's like an Healing. analgesic kind of like you can it it can numb the pain if you use it outside of your body. Like you don't oh you don't drink it. it. Okay. Yeah. But you can like rub it on your skin. She anyway, was putting drops of it and stuff. So you know. Yeah. Okay. Well, all you right. know what? <laughs> Great. It's hard comparing all the extreme fundamental denominations within Christianity, and and I know we said this a lot in like the Too Many Cults miniseries, but like 
what I want people to know is like, it's sure. Maybe it's easy to like make fun of people like the Duggars or see them as outsiders. And there are parts of them that are pretty dang extreme. But if you were raised in evangelicalism and the time that we were raised in, much of this feels really fucking familiar. And we were robbed of a lot of childhoods of watching the fucking gummy bears. And while that may seem silly, like there's so much more the messages about your sexuality, the messages about Mm -hmm. your inherent sinfulness, like all of these things weigh on you. And especially like, and gosh, what you were saying about your mom, Chad, like that resonates so much, like the pressure that's put on you to be this good child to support your family. And like the things that were put on very, very young children, like, and how you were expected to behave is not normal for a child. Like the things that I remember were put on me and that were told to me and the burdens I had to bear at a very young age, it's buck wild. Like no child, like let kids be kids. It's, it's just, and these are the things again, that I have worked out through therapy over the years and why I, you know, grew up so fast and why I, neglected so much of myself and why I didn't let myself have a lot of fun because fun was sin. And actually, I, can, I, can I ask you something on that, uh, Lindsay? Yeah. Yeah. Um, so were you ever told by your, by your father that if you disobeyed or if you were not in subjection, that he would have to quit the ministry? Ooh, no, I was not. Were you? Interesting. Yeah. I, I'd, I'd heard this as a common thread, at least in, in my circles. But yeah, my dad would say it all the time. Uh, we he were, would say, yeah. It was more like people were looking at us and we needed to be good examples. So yeah. it was much more of a, and it was interesting because my mom never quite fit the mold. And um, she was raised in a much more like her family was very chaotic. And she married my dad and like, she was always a little bit the black sheep. And so she never quite fit the mold as a pastor's wife. Like I remember she would wear really funky earrings. Like she loved wearing, she had these like flamingo earrings she would wear. And like all the ladies thought that was like inappropriate for like a pastor's wife. So she would like do little wow. things to piss people off. Right? She like bought into the system and homeschooled us and she didn't work and you know, all these things, but there were like little ways that she never quite fit in. And so I feel like, I don't know. I always tried to take from that a little bit, but no, it was just much more. We were held to a standard because we were pastors kids of like um, how we drive. Modesty was really big in our family. And um, sorry, I hope this isn't too, too, we talk about boobs a lot on this podcast as people who were like born with them. And it was a thing growing up with like, this is a part of my body and like, like finding a swimsuit that was like evangelical appropriate was a fucking nightmare. Like it it was was just not, it's not real. I remember crying. Yeah. I was crying in the dressing room fighting with my mom because I was just like, I don't know what I can wear. This is the body that like the good Lord gave me and I I don't know what to do. So Mm -hmm. yeah, it was, it was much more like you, I just needed to be a certain way, but my dad did not threaten to quit the ministry. So interesting. Wow. It's interesting uh, that that you say that about how, you know, you know, it's the body that you were given and all that, because my dad would have countered with, well, maybe that's just a sign that you as a woman are not supposed to be swimming or doing those things. You should be doing some more activities in the home. He literally would say things like that if that came about. Yeah. Oh, wow. It was horrible. Yeah. He so, like bought in a client. It, it sounds like he was much more fundy than, mm-hmm. than what we were raised with. Okay. So if, you're okay with fast forwarding. Like, so this is your childhood. It sounds pretty damn intense. Um, maybe some mental health issues, a real fundy dad. Fast forward to now you're speaking out against IBLP. You are calling it a cult. You want to take it down. How the fuck did that happen? Chad? <laughs> like, How did you get out? Well, going back to a previous question about, did I feel prepared for the real world? Not at all. Mm-hmm. So The real world happened. That was one of the main things. Uh, So in between, you know, the time I was like, you know, 12 to the time I was 19, uh, my folks decided to go back to the mission field. So I went and lived in the Netherlands and Belgium for, you know, a good uh, seven years from, you know, 97 to 2004. And So I spent most of my time being isolated, still doing the IBLP thing, still doing homeschooling, 
uh, I was being seduced a bit by the whole Joshua generation thing because mm -hmm. um, at that time, Patrick Henry College in Percival, Virginia had started up. And I went to their very first teen camps. I flew over, cool. did about two weeks there, flew back. And I was pumped. You know, this is like yeah. June 2001. I was pumped oh, wow. to like, you know, get in and like, you know, re you know, get into politics and stuff like that and make America great again before it was cool. Yeah. So, <laughs> yeah, as a 16-year-old, you know, you think you know everything. So yeah. then 9-11 happened. And I'm like, okay, maybe I knew less than I thought. Uh, and then... You know, the, the more the time came for me to leave home because dad was very adamant that at a certain point I was going to figure out something to do. Um, at that time, like the training centers weren't really an option from, from IBLP for me. So I ended up not going to one. My parents simply just couldn't afford to send me to one. Mm -hmm. um, so my options were Fundy College or just try to figure out, you know, some something to do that wasn't college related. Um, Patrick Henry College, I didn't qualify for the scholarships. Pensacola Christian College, I did, but it creeped me out. So, yeah. I, so I good ended radar. Up, I, yeah. So I ended up just taking a gap year, which I'm still on, and um, <laughs> I I ended up working for a church out in Mississippi, and. It was a church um, that was familiar to me. Uh, it ran the mission that sent us over to the Netherlands and Belgium. Mm -hmm. And they had recently undergone a huge change. Most of the congregation was older. They had hired a younger pastor. And me and him, we hit it off really well. I lived at the church. Uh, they had a big building with like uh, dormitories and stuff like that. So I just holed mm -hmm. up in one of those. I Are you like church. 18, 19 at this yep. point? Okay. I was 19, yeah. Okay. So I hold up at the church. I worked at the church by night. I was a computer tech by day uh, for a little local group out in Mississippi, the only people in town, really. And I did that for about a year. And it turns out, long story, but the pastor had been abusing his wife. Uh, and he ended up leaving the church briefly, but then coming back with her in tow saying, oh, wait, no, everything's fine. Uh, let's just forget all that happened. I want to be preacher again. Mm -hmm. And the church voted him back in. What? Oh. Of course, so, like zero of course surprise. they did. Of course yeah. they did. Yeah. It's like, please try a new mistake, guys. One right. time. So oh, that was, well, that was my first time experiencing anything like that. And here is where it really, because I knew what my dad was like in his college years. He had already told me about all the protests he had done, how he stood up to Jack Hiles and everything. My dad had been paying attention to the situation and he said, well, he said, it's it's bad, but, you know, we can't really talk about that because it will hurt the ministry if we tell anyone what happened. And I'm like, wait a minute. I'm like, this isn't what you told me you did. <laughs> like, th this guy's wrong. Like, he hurt people. So we should why protest. Can't we talk about it. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> and, yeah. And he's like, he's like, just, you know, just don't bother his ministry. Go find something else to do. It's fine. Wow. So I it never really sat well with me that that preacher never faced any consequences for his actions. Mm -hmm. And I started looking into um, some of the preachers that I had grown up with, including Jack Hiles and everything, who, even though my dad protested against him, he'd still held him in some high regard because mm -hmm. he was an IFB preacher. And other people like uh, Lester Roloff, who ran many children's homes in Texas that ended up being child torture camps. Mm -hmm. And... Mm -hmm. um, it, my dad held him in high regard too and i started looking online and researching what he did and i was like wait a minute this doesn't make any sense and then um i think the big push came when jack hiles's son-in-law jack scop who had taken over the church after jack hiles had died he was arrested charged and convicted for transporting a minor over state lines for sex wow and I that's when I told dad and I found out too right around this time that a lot of my friends here in Alabama who I had grown up with under IVLP they had also faced similar abuse wow and that's when I confronted dad and I said something is wrong uh -huh. I said you know my friends have been hurt the preachers I was raised to you know look up to they've hurt people why does this keep happening mm -hmm. and he said well we don't know the whole stories behind everything and we can't really talk mm -hmm. about it because it hurts the ministry. I said, this is wrong. I said, I did not sign up to hurt people. Like I didn't sign up for my friends to be hurt. I didn't sign up for, you know, other people to be hurt. And if we can't say anything about it, I said, you led protests. I'm like, what What's wrong? And he said, mm -hmm. well, things are different though. I'm like, well, it's not. So we had a big argument about it and I ended up leaving fundamentalism. 
And wow. uh, around that time, I had uh, found Recovering Grace online where they were talking about, you know, Bill Gothard's teachings and how it hurt people. And mm-hmm. it started to really, really itch at me. I was like, whoa. I was like, wait a minute. What, what, what's this about? So I started reading it and I was like, oh, this makes a lot of sense. Because at that time I started going to therapy and my therapist was really digging into, hey, you know, you were in a very high controlling group growing up. She's like, you realize that, right? This could be damaging. So around that time, I found Recovering Grace and I started reading it. And then the big allegations against Gothard and his harassment came out. And I was like, that was when my whole world shattered. I was like, whoa. I said, this is, this is heavy. This is like my core childhood development stuff. Like all that just shattered at one time. And I just didn't know what to do. I, you know, had a, had a little bit of a crisis and everything. I tried to make, you know, going to regular mainstream Christian, Christian churches work for me, but no one believed me when I told them where I came from. I was like, I grew up in a fundamentalist cult. Yeah, but was it really a cult though? Like, oh, was it just, you know, da, da, da. Yeah. Like I even had one preacher say, look, I know of uh, uh, places like that being very beneficial to some folks. So I hesitate hmm. to call it a cult. And I'm like, oh. you gotta believe me though. Like there was hurt. People were it's like hurt. Like the bro so code like, among pastors, right? just like so gross. Like the same people who like want to throw out whatever universal health care and mm-hmm fucking uh food stamps or whatever because like the few people who might abuse it the people who like don't want those programs for the major good are the ones that are like when it comes to like church they're like well if there's some bad like there's some yeah. good here even though it's, it's yeah it's, it's not that different than like the cop theory of like one yeah. bad apple you know it's just one bad apple which is always an interesting message when we all know one bad apple spoils the bunch but they use it the backwards way and i think it's a really interesting game yeah very, you can't just throw that common. one out and expect no consequences from now on like there's yeah. still residual stuff you gotta deal with you know yeah so that really just shattered my world and you know i just i ended up uh just leaving church and christianity altogether and i was just like i i, I didn't call it deconstruction at the time because mm-hmm. at that point there was a term for it that i knew of yeah. i was just like we didn't call I it just, that yeah yeah, I'm just going to like wipe clean everything I know, because clearly I don't know very much. <laughs> and yeah. I'm just going to try to relearn and live my life and everything. Then 2016 happened. Mm-hmm. <laughs> and I was like, it's following me, isn't it? You know, like, <laughs> yeah. the more yeah. I try to get away from the shit, the more it just keeps popping up. I'm like, well, yeah. you know, fuck it. At some point, somebody's got to say something. So I started being a little bit more vocal online, you know, especially on like my own personal pages. I was like, hey, you know, what's happening right now? I've, I've seen this like from the beginning, like this is nothing new. It's been happening and it needs to stop. Like uh, people are hurt by this. Mm-hmm. And, you know, I, I got some attention from that, but not a whole lot. It was mostly just me venting and trying to like, you know, convince people that I grew up with that, you know, things are wrong. And things really didn't kick into high gear until my dad died in 2020. Mm-hmm. And in dealing with the grief from that and just the horrible shit show that his funeral was, because it was mm-hmm. just one big gigantic uh, fundamentalist parade, I spoke to my therapist about it. And I was just like, look, you know, I just hate that his legacy is his work. Like there was more to the man for all the horrible things he did in fundamentalism. There was a man there who had interest, who I knew outside of his job. And it bothers me that that's all he'll be remembered for. And she was like, well, what about your own legacy? I'm like, what legacy? (laughs) She's like, well, she's like, you know, you have an interesting story. I feel like your story, if it got out there, could really help people. I said, it's 2020 and, you know, like everybody's hunkered down. I was like, I can't really write. Every time I do, I dissociate for an hour. It just doesn't work. Mm-hmm. She's like, well, you're into comedy and stuff. You like performing. Why not perform your story? Mm-hmm. So there's not much of a market for middle-aged man complains about his life for an hour. That's called stand-up, and I don't do that. <laughs> <laughs> so <laughs> I said, I, 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 I don't know how. And again, we're in lockdown. I don't know what to do about that. And she's like, I'm, I'm sure you can figure out a way. And that was when I started thinking. I was like, well, there is an app that you can do like one minute videos on. So I went on TikTok and I just started telling my story. I was like, for what it's worth, you know, here's what I went through. And here's, you know, 
here is why it's bad and here's why it's everybody's problem now and from that you know the algorithm worked i found cult chronicles uh lindsey williams from the documentary and i found backslidden harlot mm -hmm. heather heath also from the documentary and we all messaged each other we're like wait you too and we became pretty fast friends mm. so by the time in one of these survivor groups like the word went around that people were looking to tell their story on screen i was like you know what why not so after discussing it and having a couple of interviews via zoom with the director uh, olivia christ uh we all decided to go in together we're like hey this is our big chance we can make some good here so yeah we um yeah that was what kind of like pushed us into really saying it as loud as we could and could you at that point even imagine i mean it's been wildly I, I don't know if successful is the right word but i mean it has such a huge reach so many people watched it the conversations around it like how has that how has that felt for you like does it feel do you feel like you're able to let go of some of that like how yeah how are you feeling in the light of it being out in the world is a huge relief um you know we mm -hmm. i've been involved with the production team and everything since before amazon got involved and so mm -hmm. for like you know a year or two there was just like zoom interviews follow-up zoom interviews you know we talked for quite a bit there were questions mm -hmm. about aspects of api and iblp uh that myself and Lindsay and heather would answer and um eventually you know it got picked up by amazon and then everything became a big question mark for me i'm like okay so i knew at some point the duggars were going to be involved i'm like i didn't know how much i was like and and, and i've always said from the from day one i'm like you know please don't focus too much on the duggars because there's so much more there mm -hmm. like i mean and, mm -hmm. and i believe that their story mm -hmm. needs to be told and they're a great gateway to understanding the broader um the broader cult and they and they said, "Oh, don't worry, we're we're going to go into the cult. <laughs> you, you can bet that." So I didn't get to see an advanced release of it. I, I interviewed uh, in January 2022, and then Lindsay and Heather and I actually filmed some additional footage in Fayetteville, Arkansas, uh, in December of last year. And they used about four seconds of that in the. Uh, <laughs> we filmed all day, but there was like <laughs> one brief little moment where you could see all three of us. So I was like, "Oh, okay." So, uh, but we had fun hanging out. So that was what mattered. But uh, we didn't get an advanced screening of any of it, and we had no idea where they were taking the story or anything. So uh -huh. I watched it on the night it dropped. Uh, me, Lindsay, and Heather were going to watch it uh, up at Heather's house. Lindsay couldn't make it, but Heather and I still watched, and. Oh. I, I'll never forget, we started at 9 p.m. and we didn't finish until about 3 a.m. because there were so mm -hmm. many times we had to stop and say, this is incredible. Ugh. I'm like, they mm -hmm. absolutely, yeah. you know, hit, hit what uh, what we wanted to talk about. Now, granted, they didn't get into everything, and that's fine. Yeah. Um, there's still so much yeah. to be told about the international stuff IBLP did and, you know, some of the yeah. more fucked up things that the training centers did and some of the weird schemes Bill tried to do, like make plants grow by playing classical music to them. Like there's just so many stories that are still to be told, but for four episodes, mm -hmm. yeah, they dug into a lot of stuff and we were just so happy that now people understand <laughs> that this cult is for real like you can't just say yeah. well was it really that bad we have four episodes of evidence that it was so yeah it feels yeah. good absolutely do you think that evangelical christianity as a whole is a cult that is a good question i feel like it has become so um especially like i said after 2016 mm -hmm. and we started mm -hmm. seeing the rise of donald trump and his influence on mainstream american christianity like it had always tended to have you know individual cults i still to this day you know will proclaim from the hilltops that john MacArthur himself is a cult leader i firmly believe that certainly but um uh, but yeah, Donald Trump like united so much of American evangelicalism like I'd never seen it before. And what was chilling to me was this was, I recognized what we had been building up to and all the weird conspiracy stuff of the 90s that I grew up in. And uh, like, you know, we were, we were doing the whole like uh, claiming that you know, children were going to be ripped from their families and stuff like that from, yes. yeah. uh, from like the early nineties before it became like a mainstream thing today. 
So yeah. seeing it all being brought together is just chilling. And that's why I feel like it's important to point out, hey, no, this is old bullshit and it needs to stop. Yeah, I, I really... I really think it's amazing to hear how emphatic you are about this one whole subculture of evangelicalism when I know there are probably at least dozens, if not hundreds more, little factions of this kind of thing. And they're not all little, but they start to converge and they start to build momentum. And so we still see these same kinds of things. We see the consequences of letting Christian fundamentalism and Republican politics intermingle at such a deep and unholy, so to speak, level that we are almost numbed as an entire culture, especially people who are outside and never experienced it. Like I say easily, like, oh, I listened to Rush Limbaugh every day for nine years. Huh? People have no idea what it's like to listen to a fucking dude for three hours every day who wasn't at all Christian or kind in any way. Like he didn't even claim to be a Christian. He was just a person that all the Christians I knew listened to and believed in, except for one homeschool family I knew who like we were driving to the coast and she was driving. And I was like, I don't listen to Rush Limbaugh. And she's like, he's a bastard <laughs> or something like that. He's an <laughs> asshole. I forget. It was a swear. And I was like, what? No, he's not. He's amazing. <laughs> and they like turned it on and let me listen to it. And she could not stop just being so enraged. And I was like, this is so weird. I guess she's not a safe person. You know, I was like 12 or something, but it's, <laughs> you know, you think. It's, <laughs> yeah. And it's, it's a lot more mainstream than people think. And I've, I've seen recently in really in the Atlantic a lot, but some other publications are starting to do profiles and like pay attention to people like Sean Foyt, who are literally presenting as I'm a Christian nationalist. And also they're just a public facing figure of that. They're so deeply embedded in American politics, in evangelicalism, they're everywhere. And it's, and I'm not trying to be like alarmist or creepy, but they also are so committed to their belief in America is a Christian nation and it must be, and God needs to be in charge through people. God, he chooses. Yeah. And we, the white dudes. Yeah. Yeah. We, they're the white dudes of Christianity need to be in charge. Yes. Yeah. And this is literally what religious extremism is. And people in America are using the rhetoric of fear and of religious extremism and things like that. I mean, in that kind of prime zone where you're talking 2001 to really like probably 2005, six, seven, eight, like post Bush. Okay. Like finally we stop kind of being trenched in that, but it is, it is an amazing thing to see how well those seeds that have been planted have blossomed and also a terrifying thing to see how deep and how widespread those roots are. Like this is grassroots. You're seeing this in school boards, in judicial systems across the country, the fucking Supreme Court now, you know, we're losing those rights and freedoms one by one. And we're just watching it go down the drain because we've accepted that the system is what it is because it's supposed to be that way or something when really it's, it's not. And people need to literally be aware and wary of and truly on guard against this kind of rhetoric, this kind of investment in a militaristic force of evangelical Christians. And it sounds like I'm spouting a conspiracy theory right now, but it is absolutely real and true. And you can find it in countless iterations across this country. And of course the world, because American white people are like, you know what we need to do? Teach all these other people how to exactly be a good Christian and like make it the most insane version of it that I well, can possibly think of. And they have such a plan. Like that's the thing yeah. is like they yeah. have systems in place to like like the Joshua generation stuff to train up ch literal children to go into politics and to take over governments. And it's interesting because you see the other side. It's like I feel like we just like with I don't know, like when you look at like Republicans and gerrymandering, like we have just never we're not <laughs> we are not as um vicious i want to say and like the watching conservatives roll out it, it does feel like in my mind when i look at our country it feels like they're the fucking minority but they're yes. in charge you know and they they have 
a plan as to how to go out and dominate the political system for, you know, the sake of the ministry. It all comes back to like, I really think that what your dad was saying, Chad, about like, it's for the sake, because if if any souls get saved, it doesn't matter that that woman was abused. Right. Because, but because that pastor might lead a hundred people to the Lord. So fuck her. Right. Like, sorry, that sounds really horrible, but that's the way you're right. That it happens. That was the mentality. And, you know, I want to go back to like what you're saying. You know, that's why I said in Shiny Happy People that IBLP operated as a cult in plain sight. Yeah. There was nothing secret about what was happening. Sure, we weren't supposed to share the wisdom booklets with anybody and stuff like that unless they were into. But honestly, if you had any kind of willingness to learn and know how, you could have sat through any one of the seminars and figured out exactly what was happening. The people who worked at the University of Tennessee campus that we met at every year, they could have walked in at any point and listened to what was being said. They could have seen that child in front of everybody being, you know, mock spanked in front of folks and nobody saying shit. They could have picked up any of the printed material that Bill Gothard just spat out from his headquarters, made with slave labor, by the way, Mm -hmm. essentially unpaid interns and everything that worked long hours in his own printing press they could have read any of that and figured out what was going on it was all done so blatantly you could have walked onto the iblp headquarters campus you could have talked to any one of these kids figured out exactly what was going on at any point but people in the neighborhood just hold up and were just like what's that weird cult over there incidentally Mm -hmm. Lindsay and i did exactly that in october last year but that's another story the (laughs) point is (laughs) The point is, though, um, all of it happens so blatantly, and this personally, I believe it's because we have this mentality here in America that anything that's purporting to be Christian and religious is automatically good on some level. Right. And I'm here to tell you it's not. Whatever Bill Gothard claimed to be, like, you know, again... (sighs) Like I said in the trailer, world domination was the goal. That was what we were being taught. But ultimately, it was all about making him rich and making Mm. all of his friends powerful. And it was obvious to anyone who hadn't already been bought into it, but no one wanted to say anything because no one wanted to get involved. It was all, well, it's not what we would do, but everyone seems to be happy doing it. So we're not going to get involved and we're not going to yuck their yum. No, Mm -hmm. we needed help. Mm -hmm. We as children needed help and no one came. So the reason I'm doing what I'm doing now, and I know I speak for Lindsay, Heather, and everybody else who was a survivor in the documentary, The Oath House, Laura, everyone, we want to do it so IBLP shuts down because any other child that gets hurt by this cult is one child too many. Yeah. And again, just to the point of it is IVLP and other channels, what you're talking about is so common with my own experience where my dad went to what was then called CBN University um, and now is called Regent University, Pat Robertson's Mm -hmm. university. And so he went there during the heyday of Pat Robertson's machine. They published seeing spell read and write, which was a homeschool curriculum that is still used in Christian schools and in homeschool families across the country. And it is it is really fascinating how these people have exploited media, many different kinds of media and many different kinds of business models to accrue wealth unto themselves unapologetically and without scrutiny and also indoctrinate people and their children into the same fundamentalist belief, which is meant to be and is, and this is again to the political implications, nearly a bottomless well of financing. It's true believers who are like, I'm committed to this thing. This is a Christian nation. We're going to make it a Christian nation. We're literally Christian nationalists. We're happy with that title because we are that. Like, okay, they have all the money in the fucking world. They have all the money of God and everyone, like they will get resources without end, really. Like that's not something to sneeze at. It's not in this country and how we run our political system. One of the things that has really inspired me ever since Tiny Happy People came out are the people who, even if they didn't grow up in ATI and IBLP, like you said, they've seen it and they're like, wait, that looks like what I was raised in. Mm -hmm. You know, that looks like, uh, yeah, I can relate to portions of this because mm-hmm. I think people are starting to see it's it's small now 
And I, that's one of the reasons I keep speaking out because I'm like, there's more work to be done. IBLP is still out there and there are still people that are still doing the same damn thing. You know, uh, mm -hmm. I love that they have Paul and Morgan uh, in the in the last episode. Again, spoilers, but uh, I love they have Paul and Morgan, the uh, the Christian influencers on there because it is the same shit repackaged. Yeah. Yes. Like yeah, every yeah. single time. Absolutely. The reason every that time. cults use the same tactics is because they work. And yes, the they more work. we start That's seeing right. the patterns, the more we can shut them down. Yeah. And also let's call it what it is. It is marketing. Yes. That's mm -hmm. what that is. Influencers exist to sell things and make money. This is all capitalist shit. And it is also to the end of creating a type of religious theocracy that's obviously fascist in nature, you know, trying to remove laws like and or put things in laws like marriage is only defined as one man and one woman, you know, in spite of how they behave or whatever, like this is the kind of thing that's at stake again. And that's something I apparently can't stop saying again. I mean, and again. You're right. It's the worst. So it's like, of course we keep saying it. And it's funny because I felt like when we did like the mini series on shiny happy people, I kind of felt like I was saying the same thing over and over again, because it's just wild when you look at how many people have been subject to this kind of abuse and maybe it didn't look exactly yeah. the same as like the Duggar family you know they maybe they're outliers but at the same time like in you know we're gonna look at our, the next episode uh we're gonna record is about homeschooling and we want to get into like the coalition for responsible homeschooling and how like sure inherently on its surface there's nothing wrong with homeschooling but I have for a very long time had a really bad attitude about it and I couldn't put my finger on it like when any of my friends would homeschool I was just like Ugh. like to use very Christian language I had to check in my spirit about that mm, yes. <laughs> gosh I love you gotta love some Christianese um <laughs> but you know it is being older now realizing you are creating a a literal bubble for children in which they don't get outside input. They don't get anyone advocating for them. They don't have mandatory reporters in their life. There's, there's so many ways for abuse to thrive. And sure, maybe that wasn't the point of homeschooling. Like maybe that's not why they created it, but it's sure what keeps it going for a lot of families. And I really appreciate folks who are speaking out against this and who are talking about there are ways to do it ethically and there are ways to do it in which children can thrive but I think that the ways that we you know <laughs> were raised mm -hmm. um and because Sarai and myself were homeschooled Meg was a Christian school girl how long were you homeschooled Chad from the time I was in the kindergarten till the time I graduated Dang. first fully homeschooled of the family oh wow look what a what a badge of honor for you <laughs> Yeah, yeah. I I would have much rather been in a classroom. Honestly, it turns out <laughs> yeah. I found out as an adult I learned better in a classroom. Who knew? Huh. Oh, isn't it amazing? Just yeah. it well, seems like there are so many different modes of learning and different subjects to teach as well. Besides the Sermon on the Mount, the end. Oh yeah. <laughs> besides the wisdom packets, I'm sure you gleaned so much wisdom from those. You know, you <laughs> probably know all about how women should and shouldn't dress. So that's really and All white bread traps. versus white bread versus wheat bread so <laughs> that's, that's important who knew that that was mm -hmm. what a weird thing to camp out on by the way you know even bill gothard didn't um follow that because that man had a sweet tooth and i've learned from all the people who were close to him that he always kept a stash of ice cream sandwiches and stuff like that and snickers bars all the time what a jackass. i mean right? this guy never practiced what he preaches never. as far yeah. as i'm yeah. concerned yeah, yeah. i I've, I've yet to hear some stories about him that set him up to be like at the right hand of God or whatever but <laughs> I am really proud of Bill Gothard for being the first person to have a love affair with an ice cream sandwich and good for <laughs> him I'm very happy for him and his ice cream sandwiches Meg do you have any questions for Chad before I know you've been more listening do you have any burning questions before I like ask him to give some parting thoughts Oh, I mean, I don't think it's a burning question, but just interested, Chad, What in what ways are your like favorite ways of talking to people about why what you grew up with was a cult? Like, how do you kind of not justify it, but like, what are the ways that you articulate that to people? 
that is a really good question because it's but it's a lot easier now that the docu series is out because I'm like okay don't believe me there's four hours you know go go kill them uh, so yeah uh, that that's that's really made things easier but what I what I like to tell people is that you know we were we were raised to follow a particular man and his completely rando thoughts about the Bible. And mm -hmm. we were not allowed to question it at all, or we would be severely punished. And, and I would always point at the Duggars. I'm like, you see how well behaved they are? There's a price mm -hmm. for that. Mm -hmm. Yeah. You know? yep. uh, and, and I paid it, and so did everybody else. I said, as bad as things were for the Duggars, and we found out later just how bad, there were thousands of us that the camera were not, was not pointed at yeah, that had absolutely. as bad or worse. Mm -hmm. And I said, so what you're seeing with the Duggars is just one small blip of the broader problem. And, and I said, and I've, and I've also said like, you know, take it back to the umbrella diagram, you know, yes. the God's level, of the family and everything, Christ, husband, wife, children, that sort of thing. I said, first of all, shitty umbrella design. Second yeah, of all, yeah, it's terrible. Yeah. It's terrible. <laughs> Second of all, I was like, if you've seen that, you have seen what my cult leader based his entire philosophy on. Like, and the fact that you've seen it as a mainstream Christian or just some person out in the world, like that should worry you because yeah. it, it was born out of a very <clears throat> sick mind who thought that he had an invisible umbrella layer over everyone else. Mm -hmm. And that is worrying. So mm -hmm. that, that's usually ha how I get people into it. Like, especially if, if something happens, um, you know, like, a, like Roe v. Wade was overturned, you know, mm -hmm. I, I'd be yep. like, you know, I, I I empathize. It is tragic. It is horrible. It never should have happened. And it's been the plan all along. Yeah. Right? Like, yes. I can point to you a million things that we had back <clears throat> in the 90s that were planning exactly this. That's right. And they finally got their way. Raise your hand if you've never stood on a corner in your town or at a courthouse or somewhere else where politicians are holding a sign that said something along along the lines of abortion stops a beating heart or, you know, waved at people as a fucking child yeah. mm -hmm. in the eighties. Like I, I, like, are we raising I, hands? I did. I I no, I never did. did. No, I did. Yeah. I did. It's yeah. never have I ever. And we all did like, it's, yeah. that is so weird. That is, but we were part of that as children in mainstream evangelicalism as well. And so we're looking at uh, in a document docuseries like this, and then honestly, similar to the way that like Hillsong has been presented in different documentaries and thing is like, wow, look at this weird anomaly. This religious person who's famous has fallen from grace and now we're interested in like, it's weird and sorted because it's about sexuality. Like, wow, what a shocker. It's always that same story. There's well, always just... sexual misconduct and more. Wasn't it the big like, QAnon sex trafficking like yeah. special or whatever the guy who made that just came out with like I'll get the he kidnapped a child like of, of course right it like, takes one to no one okay let's not. just go back to the basics of childhood playground rhetoric it does take one to no one so if you're making these mass conspiracy theories about people doing this kind of thing I I'm just saying like it's not a normal thing for anyone else in the universe to be like okay, this is so crazy. It's so fringe. It's not. It's literally what people believe is happening. And they're very, very convicted about it. And yeah. also, yeah, it's propagated by people who are like, look over there. And when you're taught to only trust and follow one person, when that person becomes the end all be all, like it is blind obedience. And that does not bode well for anyone like not being able to ask questions like were you did you feel free ever to ask questions in your youth chad no, no. i knew any questions i would ask could probably become a sermon illustration later oh, oh. oh don't oh my gosh you just oh I no lindsay oh, i was like i don't even think i have a therapist candy for you Lindsay. Well, i have been a sermon right. illustration so many times oh my god i haven't even thought about that in a long time yes i have been a sermon yep mm -hmm. Yeah, you core memory unlocked right there. I could I watched that happen. Uh -huh. For everyone who's listening, go watch the video. So yeah, you get to see Lindsay. <laughs> we should post this oh, on social. 
I mean, my yes. family wasn't even a pastor, but my mom spoke at one ladies' luncheon in my childhood and told and used me as the basis for her own speech. I mean, it was technically her talking about herself, but the point that I took away at 12 was, Mom, did you hate me as a kid? Is that what you just told a story about? And she's like, Oh, the point of it was that I was so selfish. And I'm like, Oh, she goes, I thought you knew. That's actually the first thing she said. I thought you knew. <laughs> Thanks, mom. <laughs> She's like, why did you ask me, mama? Why do you hate me all the time? And I'm like, I don't know. I was a like six year old, like jealous that you were paying attention to my weirdly tiny brother and my baby sister. Like, you know what I mean? I'm going on. Yeah. I do know that um, my mom would actually introduce me to complete strangers as the kid we have spanked the most. Whoa. Cool. Shit. Wow. Yeah. Wow. Well, and you're... to have that as an identity, like on you as a child that literally is just saying like, you're the bad one. Mm -hmm. Fuck that. So are you the black <laughs> sheep? Like are, did, did others, I'm so curious, did your siblings, like, have you um, been a bad influence on them? Were you the first to leave of your siblings? Pretty much. And I'm still, you know, pretty much like the only one who's, you know, really publicly spoke out or anything. I do know that most of my siblings are protecting my mother from the docuseries at this point actively. Mm -hmm. And I've been no contact with them ever since my dad's funeral. And wow. it's probably just best all the way around, honestly. Yeah. Mm -hmm. which, yeah. which, you know, I I meant what I said in the docuseries when I was like, well, I just burned every bridge just by sitting Oof. here. So yeah, here yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah. Time's up. <laughs> Thank you for being courageous and honestly lighting that match though. I, I mean, I think it's really a powerful thing to be able to say, yeah, I'm burning bridges to a place that I no longer belong and that I don't really want to have as a part of my life any longer. And that I can see now damaged me in a lot of major lifelong ways that yes, we can heal and yes, we become more whole and yes, we're able to continue on our lives, whether it's spiritually, you know, and or other things that we we learn to do, but it still impacts the way that we experience and see almost everything that happens to us forever. And the way that we have to relearn how to see ourselves and care for ourselves as worthy creatures who deserve to be loved unconditionally is is absolutely some of the hardest work we have to do to just un brainwash ourselves from this high control religion that we were all raised in and in your case chad in a much more extreme way for sure yeah. um and that's you know a lot yeah. so thank you so much for doing that yeah you got to protect your peace and i think that it's like really amazing that you're willing to sh share your story and hope you know the impact is that other people can find that that freedom and it comes at a cost it comes at a great cost and you know something that we've talked about a lot and we'll continue to talk about is losing community it's losing family yeah. it's um yeah. but when you weigh out the 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 benefits of that and the freedom that you can find outside of those toxic uh religious systems and it's you know, another way is possible. And I think that we've all found our own way and it, and it looks different for all of us. And we're all on different journeys and we're all in really different parts of our faith. We all identify really differently and how we feel about, you know, about there being a God creator, whatever. And that's, I think really beautiful. And I will say we, it's, so we talked with this therapist a while back, Dr. Laura Anderson, who we're obsessed with. She's like a religious trauma therapist and she's lovely. And we're actually going to have her on later this fall to talk about like navigating family dynamics, because that is the one mm -hmm. thing I think we keep coming back to over and over yeah. again, is that it's, it's really, hard. how do you be in relationship with people that are still in the cult? Yeah. Yeah. And yeah. can you, for some people it's not possible. Right. And for some people it is, and it's really fucking hard to figure that out. So yeah. I think we'll be unpacking that for like ever. <laughs> yeah. I, I did want to say though, on the whole, like putting things on the line and losing things as far as, you know, my participation in the documentary, I feel like of everyone, I probably have the least to lose because mm -hmm. I was already no contact with my family. I already mm -hmm. knew, you know, I'd already been speaking out for some time. I already knew what the consequences were going to be for the most part for speaking out. And I weighed it and I was like, you know what, it's, it's too important. People need to know. There were other people involved in the docuseries that put so much more on the line. And I know personally, mm -hmm. like we've talked and there have been, you know, relationships, there have been 
families and everything put on the line and everything there have been fallout and everything that we'll never know about but yeah, yeah. yeah. i will say you know they deserve you know even more so of the credit for putting so much more out there the reason you know and one of the things that really pushed me over the edge to do it was a conversation i had with my dad before he died i was able to take him fishing one last time and i was able to get him away from mom which is the one time i could always get him to see reason and he volunteered in conversation he said okay look i did see a lot of people in senior leadership in fundamentalism that did things that probably should have landed them in jail well, but it wasn't my place to say anything right i said you're a preacher there is nobody higher in rank in the ifb there's no central uh like denomination there's no central uh convention there's just you if not you who mm -hmm. had the authority to say anything who had the right. right to say anything you spoke about everyone else why did you stop when it was your friends mm -hmm. and that was what pushed me over the edge because i was like you know if i don't say it and i have the least to lose of anybody here then who will so i'm so happy that there were people that were willing to put even more on the line and i am also really happy that people like y'all are out there you know, enabling and giving voice to people who have been through this and telling your own stories it is so important. We're going to keep talking and we want you to keep talking yeah. and we're going to keep asking everyone in whatever way they want to, how they want a Holy Ghost. So yeah, we're not stopping either. Yeah, no. And you I, know what? I, we've got, we've got each other. We have lots and lots of other compatriots. Like church attendance has dropped precipitously since uh, the last one I saw was in 1999, about 70% of Americans regularly attended or were part of a religious service of some kind. And now it's closer to like 40%. Um, and honestly, I think a lot of those folks are people, you know, millennials, Gen X, some to some degree, like Gen X, millennials, and certainly Gen Z are in a in a renaissance of, hey, wait a minute, what was that weird? Was that, yeah. should we have thought about that as a red flag? Like now that we're grown ups and, you know, have had a chance to ask the questions. You know, one of my, the things I say all the time is homeschooling accidentally taught me how to think for myself, which was not like <laughs> the desired outcome, but it, it was the thing that quickly helped me unravel that was someone just asking me the right questions and me having the learned intellectual integrity to find an answers to those questions yep. that I couldn't answer with my current paradigm. Right. So we have so many opportunities to do that. And, and it's a matter of how do we take them? And also when's the right moment and we don't have to do this alone. It's not something that you're going to be ostracized. Yes. From the people you've thought of as your family. And also there are so many amazing people out in the world who are heathens, even atheists, pagans, like whoever people are, they can be from any background or religion or, or philosophy. There are a lot of people out here who just care about well-being of other human beings and also who are invested in creating a society and uplifting a society that's based in equity and belonging and in mutual care. And I think that's the people I'd like to see win personally. <laughs> Let's Same. remember that we're in the majority. Yeah, I, I know it, it feels like in our culture, especially that we are this Christian nation and that the heathens are on the outside, but you know what? Like we're not, we're the majority now. And we need to remember that we need to have our voices loud because mm -hmm. I mean, I was a kid who didn't have a voice and I think yeah. we were all kids who didn't have a voice. Yeah. So we're going to be loud. Yeah. We're not afraid anymore. Like you, we have learned what it is. We don't respect authority anymore. You know, like we're <laughs> 40 fucking year old rebels, right? Like we're figuring out finally be like, we are, we have found our voice and we are building this community together. And Chad, like we've only been doing this podcast for a little over a year now and we didn't know what it would look like. And we knew that we had stories to share and we hoped that it would resonate with some people. And it has been a wild ride. And honestly, like, and some of it was the series, like, we did a pride month series and the shiny happy people. And June was like bonkers for us. The amount of listens that we got, because this shit is resonating with people. And it's not about yeah. us. I'm saying that there are just 
thousands of us out there who went through really similar things and we're like finding our footing and we're ready to like burn it all down. And I love this energy. And I think that like we all just need to come together and we need to keep talking shit and also supporting each other too. Like it's really beautiful to find like when you've lost the community you knew yeah. to find like new ways with people. And there's a lot of healing in that. And also like keep going to therapy, everybody. Don't quit that. Like go to therapy. <laughs> take your meds, drink your water, go to therapy, and then like come talk shit with us on Holy Ghosting. <laughs> Yes. And also let's actively, uh, you know, turn over these models of control and these political models, because I don't know why if we have Christian nationalists, I don't know why we don't have humanist nationalists. Like I would like to live in a country that's guided by humanistic principles that are focused on human beings yes. and the environment in which we live and all the things that we need to stay alive and be okay and well really prioritized. And in this country we've got with Christian nationalism, the very opposite thing is happening. It is a reflection of the four terrible things that we all, that I can't stop also mentioning in every single episode, capitalism, colonialism, white supremacy, and holy, oh my God. I patriarchy? Miss. Colonialism, I said it. Patriarchy. Patriarchy. <laughs> Thank you, Lindsay. Patriarchy. I'm Excellent. putting one in the in the jar every time Sarai mentions these things. We've right. got a right. we've got a jar, um, and we're gonna Chad buy ice cream sandwiches with that money, <laughs> and I'm gonna love it. Um, we could obviously talk about this forever, and maybe we can have you back on again, Chad. Um, thank you for taking the time for getting a new modem for like scrambling. Yeah. To I needed this. one anyway. It was fine. Well, <laughs> apparently, you have been an absolute delight. So fine. Chad, uh, Arch Radish on, I know your TikTok, Instagram, anywhere else that people can find you? Arch Radish 85 on Instagram because somebody beat me to it. And okay. I'm also on Twitter X or whatever it's called uh, against oh, my I... better judgment. So uh, <laughs> yeah, I'm Arch Radish on there. If you see Arch Radish, it's probably me. Probably you. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. And, you know, watch any happy people if you haven't already, or if you're not ready to go down that road, also totally okay. I know that Megan Sarai uh, listened to the recap episodes before they watched the show as they found that helpful. I yeah. get that it's too triggering for some people. It's a lot, but you seriously, you are a wealth of information and you're an inspiration that you got out, especially at a young, it feels like you were pretty young when you got out and to stand up to your family in that way. It's, it's pretty huge. And mm -hmm. I commend you and thanks for speaking out. Yeah, we got, we got there. We did it. We did it. We did it. I can't wait to see the video back of me, like losing my mind about being a sermon illustration. Not a thing I thought about oh, in a long time. I know. <laughs> I feel like my brain melted a little bit. I was like, oh yeah. I was but, like, oh, oh my God. <gasps> that's a good topic for therapy. Yeah. For like okay, now, more of the therapy. Go jump in the river and have the best time. And I yeah. will email you this audio at some point. Okay. Love it. Okay. Bye. Bye. Well.